We have Don Fox in the you know, top left-hand side, the CEO of Firehouse of America, Firehouse Subs. Um, so he'll be talking to us quite a bit about everything from what they've gone through in this pandemic and how well they're doing, their successes. But also he's very involved in the National Restaurant Association Board and the Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association Board. So obviously Florida had a law passed in November about the minimum wage up to $15 an hour, which will happen in, over the next five years. Uh, and of course, there's the national one that's going on now, which the news, we've been sending each other things back and forth today because uh, it's it's happening like lightning speed right now as to where it is. And we had that on our last webinar, uh, but the, um, the, the people at Cornerstone have been keeping me in touch with everything that's happening day by day and you know hour by hour almost. Uh, we have Minnie Armstrong. Minnie has been a speaker at some of our events in the past. Uh, she actually was at our first GCIA uh, combine that we did in Seattle and, and worked with us in ICCA as well. But she's a menu strategist and product for product development uh, for Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, she works with Dave Woolley. So Dave is at something else now. And I actually, I see him on. So we're going to actually bring him on as well. Um, so we'll uh, he'll be able to add uh, some you know, color commentary into Mindy's presentation as well. And then we also have Linda Ashbrook. Uh, Linda is a director of innovation and customer solutions at Data Central. And she also, but I, what you're going to hear from her is the interesting thing about her life was she was at Taco Bell for many years, actually with Jeff Van Hanswick, with many of you know, um, that are, you know, in our, in our group here today. And uh, they worked together at that point in time. So she was there for many years and worked with many other brands, Chipotle uh, and others, uh, Carl's Jr. And she'll be able to, uh, to talk about that as well. So we're going to um, start off with uh, Don. Um, if you can, you know, start and let's get get it started and go ahead and talk. And if you guys have any questions, put it in the Q and A or put it in chat. If you chat, do it to everyone so that Megan can uh, get those and hand them off to me, and we can ask the questions. But um, Don, let's hear a little bit about what's going on with you guys and the successes you've had. Sure. Sure. Thank, thanks, Kevin. And I'll try to avoid getting deep into war stories because I know everybody's been telling them. <laughs> A lot of times telling them during last year. Let me get this. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Like everybody else, things went down the drain for us uh, on about March 14th. Not on about on March 14th. That's Saturday, and uh, you know we were about negative 25 percent over the weekend. Never have seen anything like that in my career. I've been at this 47 years in the restaurant business, and unprecedented is an overused term, but it is for everybody. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, that, that required some immediate moves. So we did some things as a franchise or very quickly stopped collecting royalties, stopped collecting ad fees, not knowing what was ahead of us. Cause you know, the unknown was the, was the key challenge. Uh, at that point, what is ahead of us here? So what we know in franchising is keeping restaurants open is paramount. And not just in franchising for all restaurant tours, the most critical thing is staying open finding some way to stay open because when you close you lose control of your destiny and we firmly believe that so everything we can do to keep restaurants open that meant keeping money in the hands and the pockets of the franchisees so we, we turned off that faucet of uh, royalty and ad funds and then uh, sales got a lot worse <laughs> i mean as, as that week progressed we were very quickly within a matter of days in the range of negative 45 percent and generally stayed there for about four weeks in the negative 45% comp range. And for some context, we have about uh, 1,180 restaurants is where we were at as a system operating in 45 states. So, you know, national footprint and uh, variation, of course, around the country. But there wasn't any place that was good. I mean, everybody was down double digit. It was just a matter of about deep double digit. But we started to bounce back in about week five, and we did have some advertising dollars. and. And a, uh, one thing that was really in our favor was over the last several years, we had done a lot of work on our off-premise channel development because the industry was already going there. Societal behavior was already changing. And for us, we could see that in our data going back to 2013. And I would say 13, 14, while we were seeing it, eh, it wasn't enough of a drop in our dining business to identify it as a, as a strong trend, uh, if in if in 2016 it had flattened out or gone the other direction, I, I wouldn't have necessarily been surprised. I would have looked at it as a more brand specific thing. But by 
15 and 16, the industry reporting was coming out that way. And it was more generally acknowledged that there's a shift in consumer behavior going off from and nothing to do with an individual brand, by the way. It's like it's not like the restaurant industry's fault or you're not doing it's not because you're doing a bad job. Our best experience is dining, which is a little unusual for a sandwich shop because that's mostly off premise for most brands anyway. But our business was over 50% in the dining room just because of the nature of Firehouse. That was our strength. Despite it being our best experience, all of our customer metrics telling us that, still declining. And so that's when we started to ramp up off-premise change our packaging, uh, advanced our online ordering, uh, branded it, called the Rapid Rescue, started encouraging third-party delivery services. So fortunately, we were well downstream of that by the time the pandemic hit. And as everybody knows, a lot of brands were scrambling then. Uh, because all of a sudden it became more relevant than it had been. So we were in a great place. We were able to throw advertising dollars at our online digital channels. That helped jump start it. So by week nine of the pandemic, we were back to uh, positive comp sales. And then by about week 11, we were actually setting sales records that have continued since then every week since the, like the third week of May has been a record week for the respective time of year. Uh, so we're blessed because obviously that is not the case for the majority of brands out there, but it didn't happen by accident. A lot of the things that we had to do, things we had done before, to, so we are in a good position, we are in a good segment. Sandwiches became a lot more relevant. I would say, generally speaking, that sandwiches as a category the last few years have been diminishing in relevance. And that's reflected in the results of uh, a lot of uh, sandwich brands. I mean, Subway, most notably, they have a lot, with all due respect, they do have a lot of self inflicted wounds. And that's other brands, sandwich brands have been benefiting from that. But they're the 800 pound gorilla in the category. And if you look at the category overall, yeah, it was a, a, a relevance. Uh, issue now very relevant for portability uh, applicability to in this space so you know through this uh, you end up uh, dealing with challenges that um, are a little bit more old school I know we want to talk a lot about the labor piece and of course what uh, is so counterintuitive right now is given the unemployment and in particularly the unemployment in the hospitality industry, it's uh, a little frustrating to still have staffing issues uh, that we have. I don't think our brand's alone in that. And, and the underlying circumstances are so unique and not like anything else. So people sitting on the sidelines, even within our own industry, by the hundreds of thousands, millions, really, just staying put. But, but with uh, unique sets of challenges they may not have had before in terms of what happens with childcare, health concerns. I mean, there's so many things to play in, but all we know is uh, it's tough to, it's tough to get people. And it's, it's not a matter of how much you're you're paying them necessarily. Uh, on, so, that, on that front, Don, I know you did a lot of work and the Florida Restaurant Association did a ton of work. Uh, Dan Murphy in particular, who was a really good friend of mine and know him really well, um, did a lot of work here with that, you know, the law being passed for the $15 minimum wage. You know, it might be, you know, a little bit on that might be good to share with our, uh, with sure. our members. Sure. Well, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the referendum uh, uh, was, was passed by a fairly narrow margin. Uh, so I think it was passed by 60% um, of the, the constitutional amendment. And it uh, very similar, a model very similar after the proposed federal uh, legislation in terms of the ramp up period. It's, it's pretty, pretty close to the same, same schedule. So, um, you know, where it netted out is that the first increase will take place in September of this year. Uh, and it will go up to, uh, oh, let's say, my uh, $10 at that point. That is, the, on a percentage basis, the first increase is the largest, 15.6% uh, is where it's going up. How are people going to react to that? You know, quite simply, raise prices. I mean, that's how it's going to manifest itself. Um, I've often told people when it comes to topics of automation or or hours reduction, hey, look, the nature of the industry is everybody's always trying to avail themselves of those things anyway. If there was any low-hanging fruit out there to get 
more productivity or labor efficiency on the rest of us. We should be doing it a long time before this. Shame on you if you're not. Yeah, it was just part of optimizing the PL. Uh, automation, same thing. Now, the one difference that may come about is if, well, this isn't the case, but if all of a sudden we're at $15 overnight, that changes some of the dynamics in terms of the investments that might be worthy in automation. But we're talking about automation, especially robotics, that's easier said than done. Um, not an easy task. And so very few uh, serious efforts still to this day are out there. We talk about kiosks and payment, that type of thing. When I'm talking about robotics and food prep and so on, it's a, it's a narrow universe of players. Uh, the, the one company that uh, in uh, transparency I'm a, I've been advisor to for many years is Momentum Machines out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they actually have an operational restaurant creator. That's about as good as it gets when it comes to robotics. But, but that's nothing that, in my opinion anyway, that any brand is going to turn around on a, on a dime, or many dimes. <laughs> to right. That's, yeah. that's the not, issue. Yeah. And you're not at $15 yeah. yet. So, um, the, the, so everybody will raise prices. It's going to be inflationary. The challenge is, and this doesn't get talked about enough, I think, in concrete terms by uh, enough analysts. Um, the... The consumer has a long-standing history of only paying so much for food away from home. In the four to five percent range, depending on the data that you pull on it. And until the pandemic, that has been a constant since 1960. It, it, it moves in a very narrow range. And if you have any factor that 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 has dis, I'll, I'll call it disproportionate inflation to the restaurant industry as opposed to the general economy, which I would argue um, these types of minimum, significant minimum wage increases like this will produce disproportionate impact on our industry. Um, that inflation in menu price is that is not going to change consumer behavior in terms of that four to five percent of disposable family income on food away from home. It's it's not. So in the end, uh, it's just going to lead to less occasions. And, and that's the that's the problem. So you, you take price, you absorb it, but if it cuts into occasions and use of restaurants goes down, that means you have less transactions. And at the end of the day, what does less transactions mean? You need less people, you need less staff to handle less because it's work content related. Not even if it's work content, less work, but less hours. Um, so I, uh, of course, we're not doing it overnight. If, you, if we were going to a $15 an hour, Increase overnight. I mean, that is a well, that's a seventy three percent lift in wage. You know, you're going to have I've penciled it out in the past just to remain whole on the P and L. And as everybody listening in knows, this is a narrow margin business. Most people would agree, industry wide, five percent cash flow. Yeah. To to just stay whole with the narrow margin that you already have, you're talking about at least a twenty five percent menu. Uh, price increase to wow. compensate for it to go if you were going from 865 today to 15 now we're not we're not yeah. but if we were but but over time that's what's going to be built in so bottom line inflationary and we have to sort of cross our fingers a little bit that traffic doesn't go down uh, significantly from an industry well, overall industry perspective yeah, I've got a question for you. So, you know, looking at it, because you're obviously heavy in units in Florida, uh, yeah. but also units throughout the country in 44 other states. Um, what do you do? Are you going to have full? I mean, I know you're thinking about that. Are you going to have Florida pricing and pricing outside of Florida? Well, well, we already do. And and, and this sort of reinforces my point. In fact, I made sure, I'll check my cheat sheet, because I before the call, I made sure to double check the numbers. To give you an example, one of our franchise locations in uh, Los Angeles. We're already dealing, it's not at 15, right? But it's, uh, I think, state is 11 and uh, locally in the county, it may be hard. But a hook and ladder, just to use our flagship sandwich as a barometer, our hook, a medium hook and ladder is $8.99 in LA. In Jacksonville, Florida, it's $6.79. Wow. And $2.20 difference, a uh, 32% higher price. In LA, now there's excuse me. There's other factors out there besides just labor. They have higher rents. I mean, there's other, uh, which 
which by the way, higher wages, they, that filters into other elements of the economy and other services too. Yeah, but you look at that, that differential. So that's just a, a microcosm of it nationally. I and mean, look at the inflation that is caused there. So imagine if you wave the magic wand and everybody was on the exact same salary uh, or the exact same pay scale as prices would have to rise uh, proportionally. It, it's, there's no doubt the inflation will be there. So we're hopeful, and I just to wrap this up and move on to Mindy, thank you so much, Don. This is like being great. And please stay with us because I'm sure yes, we'll have yeah. some other questions. And Mindy will mirror some of your things, actually, when she talks about what they're doing, especially off-premise. But uh, the, uh, on the national scene, for those of you that are you know, they're in the audience today, it's like we, have, we put something up on our website about it because it's moving at lightning speed right now. Uh, and the Senate, obviously, is a little busy on something else right now. But uh, that is something that's going to be there real, real quick, and they're going to be making a decision on it. Uh, it looks like, and it depends on the time of day you read this, right, Don? But it looks like, uh, first of all, it was going to go away. President Biden said that last Friday on CBS. Uh, and then uh, what happened yesterday is you've got a couple of senators that are pushing forward for it and trying to get this done. But there are some issues within the way they're doing the voting in the Senate that because of the incremental expense of this, it may have to be dropped. So it's something we'll keep monitoring and we'll keep updating our website on. And uh, Don, anything you want to add to it as we go on to? Uh, yeah, I mean, too, but... yeah, that, that covered the highlights. If, if I were a betting person, I would still, at least as it's related to the um, COVID relief package and so on, I would uh, put money on it not happening. But I agree. without a doubt, you can put money on the fact that after that, it will ramp up and it will be a major topic during at least the first two years of the Biden administration, um, you know, in the current current environment. So yeah, we'll be we'll be talking about it more for sure. Yeah. And we kind of said last time we had, you know, somebody from Cornerstone, uh, which they're helping me get all that information as well. Um, we said that then it's like that's one of the things that we're not involved. Our associations are not involved in any kind of political action by any means, but most of their companies, their, you know, our, our member companies uh, are all involved in some way, shape, or form. And it's something where the industry really has to get out, especially when it comes to tip wages. Um, so it's something that we, you know, we need to educate the legislators. Again, this is as close as I'll ever get to politics, but we need to, because they don't really, I mean, they're, they're not in our industry and they don't really understand it. They're just looking at this, you know, purely from the standpoint of, helping people that, you know, with two incomes to be able to have a normal way of life. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, yeah, there's I, so many I, complicated things. And if, I, and, and if I may, sorry to chew into the other time, but, but you mentioned with the tip wage, which is always less on my radar screen because yeah. we're in the fast casual sector, but that obviously is the most critical thing for the restaurant industry generally is the tip wage. And uh, uh, that, uh, you know, is something that I, th I think most would agree uh, that the employees within the industry just do not want to see. Uh, they, they, it really works well for them. And that, that part of hospitality, I think, is, is one of the most magical things about the restaurant industry, that anybody can go be a server, and basically they're an entrepreneur in that role. They, they will benefit from the direct result of their effort, their friendliness, their menu knowledge, everything that they yeah. do, and they can make as almost as much as they want. And they can advance from Waffle House to Roos Chris if they want, if they want to work at it and apply their skill set. And it's, uh, and hopefully that won't get undone. I hope that. Uh, I totally agree with you. And, and to close that out, I mean, we've also all seen too, the companies that even Danny Meyer, who tried to do this, where it was like tips were then brought in. We saw the lack of great service that they used to have. I ate in his restaurants during those times. Thank God he got rid of it again. But it was something where you just saw the service go down. Servers are talking to each other in a corner. There's one bad server. And so the other ones are like, I'm not gonna kill myself. I'm making the same money as that person. So anyway, so hopefully that we'll all, you know, educate the people we can and, uh, and, and see what we can do to at least have some adjustments to it. But um, anyway, thank you very much, Don. But you know, again, hang around, Mindy. Let's uh, let's go to you. You're, you're, the timing on this is perfect. I mean, what did you want here? Because uh, we would, uh, you know, with Super Bowl just happening, I thought it'd be so cool for you to talk. About so yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so let's uh, change the subject a little bit um, and go to Super Bowl. So, uh, so Kevin and I talked last week and talked about what a great time to come talk about Buffalo Wild Wings and what we're doing. And Super Bowl obviously is a big day for us. So we wanted uh, to talk about some of the results of that day for us as a brand. And thanks for having me, Kevin. It's great to be with this group again. It's been a minute. Um, so, okay. So yes, it was a big night for us. It 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 went well. We, um, with the exception of of a few regions that had some weather issues, um, in in totality, it was a big night. So super cool. We even broke some records, which was super exciting to see the numbers come through and realize that not only had we figured out how to really capitalize and, you know, it's like innovation out of necessity, right, Don? And figuring out how do we take this off-premise business and turn it into a really, really important part of our business. And our team has worked super hard to do that over the last 11 months. And and Super Bowl was kind of like this great defining uh, goalpost, no pun intended, to say that let's look at how do we take all of the things that we have put into play and make sure that we have them ready to go for Super Bowl? So we were definitely ready. And one of the really cool things, you know, I feel I feel like it was it was destiny. And Dave Woolley is probably laughing at me right now, but you know, we've talked for years about just the fact that when you have a super familiar food and um, you're able to do some really cool things, and luckily we're, we're in the wings business, so it couldn't be a better snack food or game day food. So for Super Bowl you can understand why we put a lot of emphasis behind um, the big game. So for our wings, um, you know, what we found is that guests came to get them and, and, you know, we'll talk about sort of changing consumer behavior and new habits and rituals that are being created right in front of us and really on hyper speed. And, and we're definitely learning as we go. Um, but one thing that we saw this year was that not only did the hard work pay off, but in fact, we we did break the records, as I mentioned. So dine-in traffic was down. I mean, of course, I mean, we were down double digits in, in dine-in traffic from last year and, and previous years. But what we saw for off-premise is it was off the charts. So for our, um, for our e-commerce sales, we surpassed all previous records. So we um, definitely saw some, some, you know, new records that we hadn't set before as a brand, which was super, super super cool. A lot of hard work paid off. And um, the other thing that was really cool is visits to our e-commerce platform. Um, that was also a new record for us. So we saw um, records as it relates to people visiting the site. We saw records as it related to um, um, transactions and to our sales. So super, super, super cool. So I wanted to share a couple of things of what we did uh, from a marketing standpoint to, to get the word out and get people into our brand. Um, we did a few things. And uh, so we, we have the luck of having a really large um, loyalty um, group, a, a lot of loyalty members. So that is something we wanted to make sure that we rewarded them for their loyalty and um, did that by saying, hey, if you would order from us and pick up your wing order, early, then we will reward you with free wings. So that was something that we offered. So basically, you know, pick up by 4, 4, 4 p.m. before the big game, and then we'll give you free wings on a future visit. And then they could redeem that through, um, through our Blazon Rewards app. The other thing we did that we love and, and hope to do again and again is uh, we created a special sauce for game day. So we call it the champ sauce. It's a ton of fun to work on. Um, Dave and team and um, our chefs are all about creating kind of the next new sauce for us. But for purposes of the champ sauce, um, we actually take some of our our existing sauces and we create a mashup. So it's really easy to train in. It's really easy for our team members to create um, on the day of the game. And the cool thing is we don't know what it is because we don't know who's going to win. And so our guests don't know about it until after the winner is announced after the game is over. So we actually did this for the World Series and then we did it for the NBA championships last fall and it was a ton of fun and um, we did it again this year. So we already know who won. So you already know which which team got their own champ sauce. But if Kansas City would have taken home the trophy, we would have debuted a champ sauce that was a mashup between our honey barbecue, which is our number one sauce, and our mango habanero. So you would have sort of the, 
you know, the barbecue that that is associated with Kansas City, but then you would also have sort of the sweet heat um, mixed in and then delivered on wings. So super, super delicious. Tampa Bay, though. So if you're within the Tampa Bay market, you can actually order their champ sauce, which was a mashup between lemon pepper and orange sauce, which are two of our newest sauces that we just launched in September. And um some sauces that are getting a lot of buzz already. So we were able to mash those together in the perfect, um, you know, perfect quantities and then put those on wings and deliver those to our guests within that market. Uh, the last thing we did that we really, really love is uh, we offered free Wings for America. So a lot of fun there too. It was our third year in a row to, to put this out there. So basically if Super Bowl would have gone into overtime, we would, um, give everybody free wings. So what we what we had to do though to do that is say if it goes into overtime, if free wings are um, going to be given to our guests, we would have to have them redeem it on a future date. So it would have happened in a few weeks once we were able to sort of recover um, in terms of supply because obviously wings, you know, are a little short right now. And um, once we were able to catch up, then guests could go in and redeem their, um, their free wings. And we do that again through our, our loyalty app. So that was some of the fun things that we did. Um, that's that in a nutshell is, is Super Bowl. So again, big day, we were super excited about the results. That's awesome. Mitty, you also talked a little bit about, you know, just innovation too. you know, sure. uh, outside of Super Bowl, some of the things that you were trying to do, especially with the increase of wing costs, right, and trying to steer the, uh, the customers into other directions. Talk about that a little bit, if you will. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, we're having a ton of fun in, in innovation. And one of the things that, that we can never stop doing, I mean, even in the middle of everything that's happened over the last 11 months is, is we never stop innovating. So we're, we're looking ahead to 2022, 2020. What are we going to do next? How are we going to keep people coming in? How are we going to get repeat visits? Um, so with wings, you know, we're, we're known for that. We're known for wings and sauces, but sauces really are our anchor to innovation. So how can we use sauces to then extend uh, flavor across our menu? And for us, it's all about that bold flavor. So our sauces, when you come and have them, I mean, it, it punches you in the face, right? Like you, you smell those aromas coming in, you take the bite and it's definitely something that you remember. And we, we want to take all everything that is true about our sauces and then say, okay, what does that mean? to potentially other chicken items that we could um, look at in the future. Like how do we pull some of the pressure off of our wings business and, and, and introduce our guests to our amazing hand breaded chicken tenders or our amazing chicken sandwiches that you might not have tried before and using sauces again to sort of introduce people to these new things. The other thing we're doing is we have, an, I don't know if you guys have been and had our burger, but we have an amazing burger. So from an innovation standpoint, what we pulled back and said is like, let's raise the bar on bar food. Let's make sure that we're delivering sports bar flavor and forms that you expect from a great American sports bar and do it really, really well. So we have amazing wings. We have amazing sauces. We have our really cool cauliflower wings that are actually a plant that we can say that we have a plant-based wing now. And those are great. But then beyond that, you know, we have to have a great burger. We have to have a great um, chicken sandwich. We have to have some items that really balance out that bar food occasion. Um, so you're, you're seeing that across our menu and we're, we're spending a lot of time making sure that we are um, continually evolving our menu and making sure that we're bringing in new flavors that, that um, are still familiar, but unexpected from a flavor standpoint. Um, what else do I wanna tell you? Uh, the other thing we're doing just from a flavor standpoint is because we have permission to go bold with our sauces, we're also exploring where else can we go? So if we have wings as kind of our, our super, super familiar comforting food, then we can bring in new flavor profiles that you might not um, expect from Buffalo Wild Wings and still feel comfortable trying them because it's something that, that you know we're gonna deliver on. So things like, you know, I mentioned lemon pepper and orange, those are, those are familiar flavors, you know, but we're seeing a ton around citrus right now. And we're seeing a ton around smoke and heat. And we just launched a smoky adobo last year with our brisket platform. And, you know, how can we bring in the flavors of smoke to a sauce? I mean, that's something that Dave is trying to figure out right now, or how do we bring in, you know, new peppers? Like we have, I think we have like 26 pepper varieties on our menu across our, 
our, our sauce portfolio, which is pretty amazing. So what's the next great pepper that we need to have on our sauce menu that's going to that's gonna get our consumers really excited? So those are a few things we're thinking about. We do have a new sauce coming in March that I'm not going to, I'm not going to reveal because I promised Dave I wouldn't let all of our secrets <laughs> And we're super excited about it. So it's going to be a spicy, familiar flavor um, that you would expect from us with a little bit of a special ingredient. So I hope you all try it and tell us what you think. Hey, one final question before we move on to Linda. So, you know, March Madness was always huge for you, too. I mean, what do you how do you really look at this today in this environment we're in and say, is it going to be big? Is it not going to be big? Will it even happen? I mean, and where, where are you guys at? I mean, okay, but March Madness fans are crazy fans, right? So they're going to make sure that they watch every single game. So we we count on them to do that. And we've got the off-premise business built. So now let's go make sure that we deliver at the same level that we delivered for Super Bowl. The cool thing is there's more days associated with March Madness. So we're hopeful that that means a lot of um, really big days for us. And then our, our bars are doing an amazing job. Our operators are doing an amazing job. They're making sure that our that we are meeting all of the guidelines within um, individual states. We're making sure that we are we, we have proper protocols in place and that we do have dine-in traffic and we still have our games on and we're making sure that we're delivering against that promise as an experience. Um, so between our off-premise and our on-premise, I mean, in our minds, we're, we're, head, we're headed toward March, towards March Madness. That's when our next new menu will drop is right before the games um, so that we have some new menu items um, there that they'll be able to try as, as, part of the, as part of the experience. So we'll see what happens. I mean, who knows, Kevin? You can't plan for everything right now. <laughs> exactly. Make sure we can we can we can control the things we can control. Thanks, Mindy. Thanks so much. Yeah, so Linda's going to join us now, and uh, she's going to talk to us a little bit about something that is near and dear to all of our members, actually, and all of our sponsors as well. But some of the processes that she's been familiar with from her early days with Taco Bell and many other brands that she's worked with along the way, and of course now what she's doing with. Uh, with Data Central and how they're trying to, you know, take that platform and share that with a lot of different companies so that they can really be better at uh, at innovation. So, um, yeah, my background um, is pretty much an in innovation, um, starting with, well, not starting with, but most recently, I guess, with, you know, Taco Bell. Um, also, since I've left Taco Bell, work with, you know, a number of other brands, um, and I'm just going to go through um, a little bit about innovation. I've got this PowerPoint. I promise I won't completely bore you with it. So basically, you know, when we look at um, innovation, especially among some of the, the more um, brand, the more innovative brands, I guess, the ones that are really, you know, pushing the edges right now, you know, like I said, a Taco Bell, a Chipotle, and um, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I it doesn't happen by accident. It's not, you know, it, it is very, I mean, honestly, these brands, the McDonald's, et cetera, you know, they're a machine. They, you know, they definitely um, are, um, you know, have, have long cycles, you know, um, of innovation, you know, and deep pockets, of course, you know, but I think that innovation in, you know, as, as a broad process does not have to be all the way to a Taco Bell or McDonald's, et cetera, in terms of, you know, the timelines. But I think that any brand can definitely um, benefit from um, putting, once again, some process in place that can help them take something from, you know, the very end, to, from the very beginning to the end. And we call it, you know, here, it, it's basically a stage gate. We've all done stage gates. We call ours idea here at Data Essential. You know, when I was at Taco Bell, we called it Dead Vim. Other people call it, you know, other, um, other names. Um, but, but it's effectively making sure that there's a reason for everything to be on your menu from the time that you innovate it, you're solving for a problem of some sort, um, you know, whether it's, um, solely, um, you know, you're filling something on the calendar, whether it's, uh, you know, competitively, you know, chicken sandwich wars is a, a perfect example of, um, how you might be, uh, you know, wanting to compete. But once again, and it starts with innovation, um, you know, uh, development, evaluation, and, and, and activate. Um, for some reason, I'm not, here we go. There we go. Um, and so if you think about um, developing products, 
really, you know, it, it, it doesn't start once again. It's not like, you know, in general, I mean, every now and again, it's like, Hey, I have an idea. It's a great idea to go forward, but really, you know, it starts casting the net wide. Um, and again, a lot of this, these numbers, you know, I, I'm talking, you know, from my Taco Bell days, from, from big brands for us to get to about 15, 10, 15 items that might go on air. We'd start with about 500 broad ideas. Um, you know, we've all done um, ideations, et cetera, that kind of falls in that inspiration um, bucket, you know, where we'd kind of just really cast the net wide, whatever we were solving for, um, you know, across the board throughout the year. Um, we would then go to, you know, a preliminary ideas screen, which is really a great way to just get rid of the dogs, you know, almost a thumbs up, thumbs down, um, you know, as necessary going into concept refinement positioning, concept testing, um, in-store testing, you know, basically at some point you got to get into your customer's mouth. Does it taste good? Is it delivering upon the promise, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then ad testing prior to launch. Um, and, you know, like I said, the preliminary idea screen is, is a great way um, to um, um, sort these early winners and losers. And really in general, um, it's a great way to, um, when you've got these, these, these um, large amount of ideas is to once again, get the dogs out. I mean, we've all had this, you know, I don't know, a VP, a CMO is at the grocery store and all of a sudden, you know, the next, they come in on Monday and go, Hey, I saw this cool item on an end cap. We should all be doing, you know, it may or may not fit with the brand, et cetera. These are great ways to go. Yeah. You know, that, there may be a kernel of an idea there may not, you know, we can, we can check it there. It's also a great way to start, you know, when I was at um, Taco Bell, for example, one, one thing we put through a preliminary idea screen was um, a short rib taco. We thought it was a great idea, you know, at the time, whatever we were trying to compete against, I don't remember, you know, we put in through the preliminary idea screen and it just bombed. One of the reasons it bombed was everyone went, wait a minute, why would I have, a they thought bones were going to be in it. Why would I have a taco with bones in it? That makes no sense. You know, at that point, we could have refined the idea, refined the positioning, refined the communication. It, we chose not to pursue it, but those are great things that can happen out of um, preliminarily, um, screening. Um, you know, at, um, at Data Essential, we have things, you know, but, um, and, and, and everybody has some sort of um, way to do this, you know, but you know, it's looking very basically purchase interest, uniqueness, frequency, draw. And I was saying draw is really important. Draw is that piece, that special trip intent where it says, would you drive past five other places to get this item. You know, we're in a highly competitive environment. Um, you know, for example, a burger, you know, there's, uh, you can throw a rock and hit a burger place. Why would, why is someone driving past all those burger places to get to yours? And that's a great, um, about that metric draw. Um, you know, and then, like I said, between the preliminary idea screen and the, the concept testing, things to think about, again, that concept refinement quali qualitative, we would do that a lot. We did a lot for breakfast, for example. You know, if it's a new idea, maybe it doesn't fit with the brand. Maybe it's, you know, um, Taco Bell was always trying to do, for example, sandwiches. You know, so it'd be like, is it a torta? Is it a sandwich? Does it have to be in a tortilla? Those are great things that the consumer can directly talk to you and, you know, where they're having, it, you know, problems in, in terms of just wrapping their head around your idea, you can help sort of start um, um, getting closer to the kernel of the idea. And the same with the positioning, you know, it, again, is it is it, uh, you know, a burger that's intended to be filling? Is it, you know, there's many ways you can go after something, right? It's a filling burger, it's a spicy burger, it's organic, it's 100% beef. All of those may be true of the same burger. So, you know, that's kind of where the positioning comes in. And then once you've kind of got all that together is just, you know, a really nice solid concept test. This is at the point which, is this a good idea? You know, you, you don't really want to put a lot of time and effort, you know, whether or not you're all the way to the Taco Bell where you're putting a lot of money into it, you know, but even a smaller brand, you're still putting time and effort and energy. And as I'm working on A, I'm not working on B. So at some point you need to identify which are your better bets. Um, and that's where concept testing comes in. It's still the idea. We don't have a product necessarily yet. Um, 
And at that point, again, just in terms of the metrics, again, we're looking at purchase interest, uniqueness, frequency, draw, branded PI. Oftentimes there's things that maybe it's a good idea. You know, everyone loves a good steak, you know, good steak at 7-Eleven, maybe not. Or the flip side, I see this all the time is, you know, um, X, Y, or Z drink. Uh, not sure. Oh, it's from Starbucks. Once I inter- insert the brand. Oh, heck yeah. You know, they can, do, you know, or, you know, coffee bean or, or whomever. Um, so branded PI versus just um, unbranded PI is, is an interesting thing to watch. Can your brand do it? Um, likes, dislikes, those are t- typically verbatims, you know, value, brand fit, um, et cetera. Um, and one thing to kind of mention, and I'm going to flip through this, is just we've. I think most of you have probably seen this scores as our concept testing. Um, you know, and you kind of get you know a lot of information. But um, I'm going to go into this a little bit. Um, you know, innov- innovate is that upfront um, part, and it's 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 really important. And you don't always have to innovate. Sometimes you know you've got this fastball down the middle. Um, and you are just, you, know, you just need to maybe tweak it. This is maybe stepping back a little bit. Um, you know, some good examples, you know, um, um, from, from Taco Bell, for example, my Taco Bell would have been breakfast. We know we need to do this. We know breakfast is a really important day part, not necessarily a great fit with our brand. How do we get there? We do immersions, we did ideations, we do screens, we, you know, we, we'd go back and do immersions, ideations, you know, we'd refine, et cetera, et cetera. So um, depending on your needs, innovation, you know, that innovation session is, or um, part of the process is, is really important. Um, and, you know, some things to think about when you innovate, um, you know, and this is just from years and years of experience. If you can make it cross-functional, there is nothing worse than, you know, you get together and maybe you just, you know, culinary and marketing get together. They've got some great ideas and, you know, they start to move forward and then they include ops. And all of a sudden ops is like, we can't do that. We've all had that, right? You know, um, there's backflow on that or whatever the issue is. Um, you know, if, if, if everybody's holding hands up front in as much as you can, and, and sometimes you just can't, um, it's, it's, you know, everybody has early ownership of it. Um, cast a wide net, you know, um, do, um, you know, we used to, when we'd ideate, we'd often include just a, a, a wild card. Um, I'll give you an example of we were, I, I don't remember what the, the brief was, but we were ideating. Um, and we included, you know, our normal suppliers um, in there, you know, perhaps, a, you know, I don't know, Tyson, you know, or whomever. But um, someone said, hey, let's include Frito-Lay um, in there as a complete wild card. Um, and and that, that ideation ultimately led to the Doritos Locos Taco at Taco Bell, um, which, um, you know, is one of their most successful launches ever. Now, interestingly, I mean, I will say that the Doritos Locos Taco had been on our radar for probably a decade before, but that would, it just happened that everything came to, was, was working at that time that we could actually do it. To launch the Doritos Locos Taco, we had to build new um, manufacturing plants, et cetera, et cetera. We had a leadership who was willing to invest in that. You know, it was just the right thing at the right time. But once again, had Frito-Lay not been invited to that particular ideation session, it wouldn't have, it, it may not have happened at the time that it did. Um, another really important thing I mentioned earlier, likes and dislikes. I think people in research really miss the benefit of reading the verbatims. You know, when you ask open ends, take the time to look at them. People will tell you what they like and what they don't like. They will tell you whether it's, you know, they have some passion for it or not. You know, one of the likes is, what do you like about this, you know, burger? You know, look, and do people say, oh, it might taste good, or is it more like, hell yeah, when are you launching it? Those are things you can get some early indications of, you know, how much, you know, passion for a project, et cetera. You can also, you know, it goes back to the idea of, as I had mentioned earlier, that like that short rib taco never occurred to us that people would think there was bones in it, you know, and, and that's where you can start to help refine your ideas, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, kind of the other ends don't necessarily fall in love with everything. You know, you, you may think you have a great idea, it may not be a great idea, you know, or the, the consumer may not quite understand it. Um, you know, so an example is, um, you know, we had a, um, our CMO was really enamored at the time of Taco Bell launching a hamburger 
boy, was he, I mean, it was like, this is going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread. Um, and, and we actually, every step of the way, the consumer told us, nope, 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 nope. We tested it and tested it. Um, but we kept pushing it because, you know, there was some internal passion for it. We ultimately, we, we developed like a, it was like a burger wrapped in a, a tortilla, you know, I think like crunch wrap, but with a burger patty in there. It was, you know, it was not a fit with our brand. It wasn't our best effort. Um, we went all the way. I think we actually launched it as I remember, um, you know, but, um, you know, one of my favorite stories about that is when um, during test market, we would go to the test market and kind of, you know, just go to the stores and order it order whatever product. And, and at that point on that particular one, we're, we're at the store, we're standing there like talking to the, you know, the, the cashier, Hey, you know, what do you know about this? I think we called it a grande griller. What do you know about this grande griller? I kid you not. She looked at us and said, Oh, you don't want that. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, those are the kind of things that, you, you know, we couldn't even get our, our own employees to fall in love with it, much less our consumers. And of course it was a dismal failure failure. So Long-winded way of saying, you know, you got to be um, objective and, and let things go. Um, at the other end, don't throw away good ideas. That doesn't mean we had um, a product. Um, we knew early on that the idea of like meat as a carrier was a good idea. Um, you know, and we, we ultimately came out with a, a couple things like a chicken chalupa, which was that the shell was made out of chicken. And we came out with some like chicken nachos where the nacho chip was a, a, a was chicken but when we came we came up with it years before we ever launched it because we couldn't develop it nobody could make it for us so we just you know kept it we, we we kept a list of our good ideas and we just kept it and then ultimately somebody could make it for us and you know again some big successes for us um so you know those are some um some things with um when, when you're ideating is you know Again, and a great thing too is, you know, like I said, if you're looking at keeping these these 500 ideas or whatever the number is appropriate to your brand, is keep a list. You know, somebody should be the keeper of these great ideas. Um, you know, so that you don't, you know, you may be revisiting things two years after it actually, um, you actually think about it. You know, now under develop is more okay. We've got a great idea. We know that chicken as a carrier is a great idea. Um, we've got, you know, somebody who can actually make it, but what's it actually going to include, you know? Um, and that's that develop stage. And within that, of course, is where you're working very, very closely with culinary. Um, and then at that point you are um, putting, you know, as you've got now some really solid ideas, you are um, putting it in front of the consumer, both in terms of conceptually. Now it's not just this, 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 sort of ambiguous idea of chicken as carrier, but now it's a chicken chalupa, it has some kind of sauce, you know, it has a build, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately this is where you would um, somehow, whether you're doing it through in-store testing, whether you're doing it from CLTs, whatever, is where you'd want your consumer to actually taste it. And things to think about as you're developing, I, I think we all know this, I'm gonna flip through this, is it a core versus an LTO? What, what's the reason for it to even be? What are the cost of sales targets? What's the ops impact? You know, what's the availability? Um, you know, do you need new packaging, you know, et cetera. Um, so once, you know, it's past that stage gate, you know, there the are things we, we do. You go to some form of a test market or, you know, sometimes we just, you know, launch depending on your organization. And at which point within the test market, you're, of course, looking at, you know, the, you know, the advertising, the promotional lef level, the awareness, you know, you're refining forecasts as necessary. And then the last thing, of course, is activate. You know, you've launched it. And after activate is where you're looking backwards. Did it meet our goals? Was there issues? You know, did we, was our forecast correct, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so, and, and I think the big, something important too, and is this idea that this is a process. It's not haphazard. Um, you know, we'd often have briefs. Um, you know, depending on your organization, you know, um, depending how formal or informal it is, um, you may not. But to get past each of these stages, you have to have some sort of, again, a stage gate. It, you know, at some point, you need to evaluate um, why this product is or, or this, yeah, this product is going forward. Um, so, 
that's it. I mean, like I said, I, I, I flipped through this really, hopefully quickly, not, you know, not because, um, mostly just because, like I said, I think each organization has to decide how the process works for them, for their organization. You know, are you formal? Are you more casual? But just this idea of um, including a process um, to, I mean, there, there's, there's, we've had a pandemic, you know, my friend um, actually does the testing for Chipotle. They never stopped, you know, they never stopped innovating. They never stopped the process and they just kind of pivoted, um, you know, to continue um, working with their consumers and understanding, um, you know, what's working and what's not working so that, you know, as the pandemic ends, um, you know, they've got a full pipeline. And just let, once again, you know, this, this entire process is designed to keep your pipeline going, you know, for years out. So um, Dave Woolley is with us as well. Good to see you, my friend. So uh, uh, and you. I know, so oh, Jay Miller, I know is with us um, here now. And uh, Ben Newland, I know with, um, you know, with the Buffalo Wild Wings is with us today is in the audience as well. So appreciate that. I think a question out to, you know, both brands here is, you know, what Linda just said, uh, why don't we talk, Don first maybe, and then Mindy and Dave, you know, uh, follow up with that, about your processes for innovation and how big your team is and, you know, and and, uh, and kind of maybe an average of how long it takes for you to go from, you know, initial idea to uh, something being on the menu. So, Don, you want to do it first? Sure. You know, we've uh, evolved this over the years, and I, I'll say, uh, I would say this whether Jay was on the line or not. But Jay, Jay is a tremendous asset to us. So he's uh, really our first uh, true culinary professional that we brought on board several years ago. Uh, and I should throw in the caveat, our founders, uh, Robin Sorensen and Chris Sorensen, uh, that is um, one part of the business that they are also still really passionate about. So you, you might imagine if, uh, well, you don't understand if you worked in an entrepreneurial uh, business like that where founders are involved, uh, that that's its own unique skill set in, in working with them. But, but Jay's been marvelous at that. And so he's brought more structure to it than perhaps what we've had in the past. And and really along the lines of what Linda talked about, we take many of those uh, principles and build them into our processes. One, one thing that uh, has changed over time is that um, we went through a phase in large part driven by the fact that I was in research and development for six years with Burger King. From, from 89 to 95. So I was the first person that came to Firehouse with that kind of background and needed to bring some disciplines in because there was a lot of shoot from the hip, totally intuitive type of activity that as we became larger in size was more consequential if it misfired. When you only have 100 or 150 units, uh, that's one thing, you're growing by the hundreds of thousands plus units and you make a mistake and the, and the ramifications of supply chain and cost of the brand is just incredible. So we put in the traditional testing methodologies. Of, the way I always uh, dealt with it was feasibility testing, you know, just based, but in-house first restaurant or two operations testing. There might be about a, uh, a half dozen, 10 restaurants testing across different platforms, you know, different types of kitchens or layouts. Then go to a market test, um, test the advertising and so on, and then make a rollout decision. Um, and so much of it is getting the projections for supply chain. How much of this you're really gonna sell before you go out and lock and load on, uh, on purchasing commitments. Uh, but we've, as the years progressed, because that takes a lot of time, has its own costs embedded in it. Uh, so we've been a little bit more selective depending on what the item is, where we'll do more consumer uh, work and rely more on that paneling and so on uh, to arrive at some of those estimates. But, you know, you can still, you can still get burned. It, it always, it always comes with some, some risk. So, I think in the end, at least for an organization our size, as CEO, what I am really counting on uh, increasingly over the years, because I've been here now going on 18 years, I rely very much on the institutional knowledge that's in the organization. Now I'm very fortunate because I have very low turnover. Uh, my management team, I built the management team here over 18 years and hardly anybody ever leaves. So that institutional knowledge really stays retained. Not all brands, uh, many brands don't have the advantage of that. Um, 
Uh, so oh, I'll ride that institutional knowledge for as long as, <laughs> as long as I can. I know Matt, uh, Matt Riddleberg has been with you for many, many years as well. Right. Jay's on with us now. So Jay, if you want to add something in and then we'll go to Mindy and, uh, and Dave. Oh, it's great. I think Don's, Don's said it pretty good. Uh, I definitely have fun with our founders trying to keep them happy and our guests. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of it's gut and a lot of it's research. So it's, and you, we just kind of marry both of that up to make it happen. Great. Yeah. Well, good to see you there. Thanks for being with us. So Mindy and, and, and Dave, you guys want to chime in and talk a little bit about Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, Ron, I, just, wanna... I just want to add, you know, even though there's that institutional knowledge, again, having a professional like Jay is so important because he takes the lessons that he's learned from multiple brands. And, and I often say the, the, the most valued information that anybody has is to know about the failures, the mistakes. I and mean, that's where the learning comes. It's not so much about walking in the door and saying, let me tell you about the next greatest thing. I'm, no, it's, it's, hey, let me save you guys the pain of going down this road. I, uh, a quick story. I will never forget one of the institutional knowledge I did for Burger King was the first time they ever went to do pizza. That wasn't my project. It was somebody else's. <laughs> and they realized not until they went to put the sell the first pizza through the drive through window that it wouldn't fit. <laughs> That's not when you want to be finding out. That's funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yep. There's, yeah, there's a lot of great stories like that around the industry. I kind of send that to Linda yesterday. We had a conversation. My favorite thing to ask, because we merge, when we do our events, we merge fine dining chefs and independent restaurants with chain members that we have. And the first thing I ask them to do is like, let's please talk about that story on your menu of the one item you can't get rid of that you hate and you just want to get rid of, but you can't because they'll murder you if you do. And what's that one item that you love that you wanted for the menu? And they said, no, <laughs> it didn't work at all. So Mindy and Dave, why don't we, let's go to you guys. Let's talk a little bit about, because I know you're you know, multiple brands you know, within your building, so you've got a lot of different departments, but in particular, let's talk about Buffalo Wild Wings and you know, kind of your uh, processes and the size of your team. And I know Ben's on here as well, uh, yeah. but uh, we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. So Dave and I and Ben and Tara, we've got this amazing team and um, we also serve alcohol. So we have a mixologist on our team, which makes for really good days. Um, so I, uh, Dave, you'll have to help me. So we've got on our culinary team, we have three. Three, correct. Three chefs, yes. And um, and then myself, I've got a team that we're really focused on um, kind of what is our menu strategy and where are we going, what's our um, what's our innovation process look like, and then standing that up and, and implementing products across our system and into the field. And then our beverage team, we have um, four team members on our beverage team. So, um, and then we have Mr. Jamie Carowin as well leading the charge. So that's 10 of us, is that right? On our, on our F&B team. So yeah, he's he's been known to uh, to to shake a shake a cocktail and uh, and uh, fry some wings here and there too. So yeah, so we have a Mindy. Movie. You added uh, you you added something interesting yesterday when I know you guys had something to do with you know the, the executive team. Uh, what's tell us about this wine wall that you have? You know. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's that's so, actually it's that's so the dangerous. innovation is what that is <laughs> yes great wine on tap every day is uh is really the secret sauce for me um but we also you know the cool thing is we're you know where the, the cool thing about inspire brands is we're having we when you bring all these brands together it also means that you have coffee in the morning and you've got and you have our our beverages that we're we're focused on so we have a we have a signature beer as part of our brand. So we are able to have that on our wall so everybody can experience some of the, the beverages that we're serving in our bars and experience those. Because a lot of our team members aren't out in the field. They're not out in with our team members trying some of our some of our new things. So that gives us a chance to showcase those items. We had a little bit of that last night, right, Dave? We sure did. Yeah. I like, um, I like it's awesome. Well, I like unfortunately, we ran it off and over here, but I'm sure what's going on in Jay's mind right now is a message that's going to be sent over to Don saying, hey, where's our wine? I'm sorry, Don. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks it's to really all of really you. Really, really appreciate uh, really appreciate all you being on here. Uh, thanks again to all of our members and sponsors that are out there viewing um, and listening. Uh, and this video will be up on Friday as well, as we always do as with a PowerPoint. Uh, presentation that Linda did. And thank you so much for that. 
But uh, really appreciate it. We're going to close out as we always do with a with a video here. So, uh, Mike, if you will show our video, and thanks again to everybody uh, for being both a participant and also um, being here to listen to us today. And our next one will be in two weeks, and we're going to announce next week too uh, more of our dates and events coming up for this year. But like I said, everything's going to be from June on, and we're going to be able to do. Uh, my gut feeling is we're going to be able to do all of our events this year for both associations. So. Thanks again. Have a good one and we'll see you in two weeks.